Oh, uh, yeah, please. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Okay. So recording has started. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, my name's Steve Gamboris and I am a PhD student in the MetaMelb Research Group at the University of Melbourne. Um, I'll begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation as traditional owners of the land that I'm presenting from, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders, past and present. So I'd like to welcome everyone to this session, uh, What Counts as Success? The Case of Evaluating Open Science Badges. Uh, open science badges have been a particularly visible and colourful symbol of the open science and meta-science movements, uh, but recent debates over the um, evidence for and against them um, have raised uh, broader questions about how we evaluate evidence in the meta-science context, uh, and, but also about how we might gauge uh, success and failure of interventions and initiatives that are part of uh, meta-science. So this panel is an opportunity to explore those questions um, focused around this case of um, badges. Um, I'm very pleased to um, introduce our panel speakers uh, to you. Um, Brian Nozek is the co-founder and executive director of the Center for Open Science and professor in the Department of Psychology at the University of Virginia. Uh, highly relevantly for today, Brian has been involved in the Open Science Badges Initiative since its beginning. Uh, Anissa Rahani Farid is a postdoctoral fellow at the Restoring Invisible and Abandoned Trials Initiative at the Pharmaceutical Health Services Research Department at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy. Uh, Anissa was the uh, lead author of a randomized control trial published in 2020 of open data badges as an incentive to share data at the journal BMJ Open. Uh, the results showed that the incentive of a badge did not noticeably motivate researchers to share their data. Uh, and and um, our other panelist is Hilda Bastian, who's a writer and cartoonist and was a longtime consumer advocate in Australia and is co-founder of the and co-founder of the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, Hilda is the author of the PLOS blog, Absolutely Maybe, where she has written criticisms of the evidence for open science badges and recently invoked the case of open science badges as a cautionary example for a wider argument about the need for more self-criticism in meta science, uh, a piece which caused a lot of discussion and responses online, um, including from Brian Nosek on, on Twitter. And that more or less brings us to today. Um, I'll, I'll just give a very brief introduction to open science badges, just in case people aren't entirely familiar to um, familiar with them. So I'll quickly just uh, share my screen. And then Okay, um, so open science badges um, are, are badges which are um, a uh, incentive um, for um, sharing open data or sharing materials or pre-registering research. Um, and they are, as I said, they're an initiative of the Open uh, Center for Open Science. And they've been first, they were first used in 2014 at the journal Psychological Science. And since then they've become used at over 75 um, uh, uh, journals. Um, just, uh, just so you know, when we talk about badges, we're talking about the literal colorful symbols um, which appear on the title page um, of um, of a uh, of an article um, in the contents um, uh, page of the journal um, issue, uh, and also on the contents page on the um, website, um, the journal's um, website as well. Uh, so they're the um, visible indicators of the open practices. Um, this is uh, um, a the study from um, 2016, um, which was a ob observational study of, of looking at data sharing in psychological science, both before and after badges were introduced, introduced um, showed a dramatic increase in um, percentages of um, uh, the percentage of articles reporting um, sharing their data. Um, I'm a bit, a bit uh, I'm being careful about how I uh, phrase this. I, I don't want to um, make any causal. Um, uh, uh, statements because that's part of the um, uh, debate which is which has arisen um, arisen from this. So I'm going to um, I'll stop sharing uh, there, and what I'll uh, uh, do is I'm going to just um, ask a question um, for uh, each of Brian, Anissa, and Hilda, and then we'll move on to some more open discussion questions. And if people watching have questions or points they'd like to raise with the panel um, as we go, please do put them in chat and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So my first question is for Brian. 
So Brian, going back to 2012, 2013 or so, before the Badgers Initiative started at Psychological Science, what was the uh, initial vision uh, for Open Science Badgers and what expectations did you have about the initiative's success? Thanks, Steve. I appreciate you putting together uh, this panel. One of my favorite and most challenging topics is thinking about this dynamism between evidence and the interventions uh, that we are pursuing, pursuing for the activist goals of the open reform movement of how do we uh, increase transparency and otherwise. So I'm delighted to, that it worked out to join with us. Uh, we did get advanced warning of questions. So I, I prepared a couple of slides that I thought that the response might be most um, uh, instructive to sort of situate how we think about badges in our the theory of change that the organization uh, Center for Open Science that I work at uh, operates by. And our theory of change is really instrumental because it guides how we structure our organization and our teams uh, and all of our initiatives are designed to reinforce and support that theory of change. So I'll give the very brief uh, version of that uh, and then put situate badges within it. So the we exist to increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. And historically, we focused on three particular behaviors as our primary interest, sharing data, sharing materials, and pre-registration. And the model uh, that we operate by, the theory of change, is really leverages this long history of the fusion of innovation models of how is it that new technologies or new behaviors get adopted. And a core element of that that we use and extend uh, is the notion that people come with different motivations or interests uh, that lead them to be at different places on the adoption cycle. People who are at the front end of an adoption of a new behavior, the innovators are motivated by the behavior itself. They're excited to try the behavior and it's itself uh, the reward, right? Early adopters see the promise in the behavior and so adopt it regardless of what the cultural context is. But moving into the majority, early and late majorities, one has to take into account the, the norms of those communities. Why are, who is doing it? Why are they doing it? What is this all about? And also the incentive, the reward system. What's in it for me? Why should I do this behavior? And then of course, at the tail end, uh, the laggards, it's often uh, for getting them to adopt the behaviors, there has to be some kind of policy requirement. You just gotta do it. So in that context, uh, we think that the, there's a very strong need uh, to have an uh, a multi-level in intervention to have maximum success in gaining adoption. So I'll put this in the context of pre-registration, one of the three key behaviors. So at the, at the top end, it's the initiating of the behaviors, the things that are sufficient to get something started but not sufficient to get full adoption are things like having infrastructure that makes it possible to do the behaviors. So OSF registries as predicted, uh, the RIS, the Registry of Effect Efficacy and Effectiveness Studies, these are registries that make it so that people can do pre-registration. And then to encourage greater adoption, strong attention <clears throat> to user experience, making the workflow easy to do it, uh, providing templates for how one pre-registers, providing customization of those uh, so that different communities that use different methodologies can adopt those behaviors. So all of that can get some behavior adoption started, but isn't sufficient on its own. At the other side are considering the incentives and the policies, right? So in the context of uh, pre-registration, we focus on how is it that we can get funders uh, to incentivize uh, pre-registration as part of uh, getting funding or to reward uh, funding uh, or reward pre-registration when one does it. And then the model of registered reports fits in that, right? You build pre-registration into a key incentive, getting a publication. And then on the requirement side is the top guidelines, right? Here are the policy standards from a funder or from a journal or from a uh, institution of what their expectations are uh, for pre-registration otherwise. Okay, so that's on the two sides. Uh, sorry, this is super quick. I just wanted to give you an impression of how it is that then badges fits into that, which is right in the middle of this, um, is the norms. And norms are really important in the context of the scientific community because it is so decentralized. How we decide how our science works uh, depends on what we see others in our communities doing. 
uh, and they influence us on what the standards are for how we report, what kind of statistics we do, what design works, what kind of language we use for things. Uh, and those are shaped by things like engaging in academic debate. Here's what pre-registration is. This is why you should do it and fi oh, fighting about it as we do with lots of uh, possible behaviors. Providing training services so that people as they start to see that this is becoming something that is adopted, they gain some skills and know how to uh, adopt the behaviors. And then the badges part is on visibility. And the key part uh, for what the badges help do integrating with all of these other uh, interventions is that as those innovators and early adopters start to do the behavior, badges help make it visible so that you can see that the norms are changing, right? Pre-registration, I've heard of that, nobody in my field does that. Oh, wait, now I can see more instances where other people are doing that. Oh, maybe that's something that we do now. And so it might then shape the likelihood that the community perceives that norms are shifting and then adopts those norms. And from the work in social norms, the role of signaling uh, through badging or whatever other types of signaling mechanisms uh, one uses is most important when there is a gap between what the belief systems or the, or the actual behaviors of a, of a community are versus what they're perceived to be, the perceived norms versus the actual norms. And this is just an illustration. I can say more about the, the data source if, in discussion if it's of interest. But at the top here, are the, this sample's report of whether they favor pre-registration or not. 52% say they are in favor or very much in favor. 16% say they're opposed or very much opposed. Uh, but the perception from the same sample of what the, what the community feels is shifted to more even uh, pro and con. Right, suggesting that there is, uh, to the extent that the, re the sample is a representative sample and the reality uh, set, uh, that there, people are over perceiving the norm to be counter uh, to pre-registration than not. So, when the, so the, this research in social norms suggests that this is really where you can have the biggest impact in helping to facilitate behaviors to shift people's understanding of where the norms are. So that's the, the you know, five, maybe it was more than five minutes. That's the short version uh, of how it is that we think of badges as being important in our overall model of change. So hopefully that's useful for context for this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. That was great. Uh, so uh, next question um, is for Anissa. Um, how did the um, idea for the badges randomized control trial at the journal BMJ Open uh, come about? And was there any discussion about conducting the trial versus the journal just adopting the badges outright like psychological science did. Um. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you for inviting me to this panel. And thank you to Brian and Hilda um, and Adrian for being here and to all of you for being here to support this very exciting discussion. So I did my PhD looking at the role of journals in promoting a culture of data sharing and open science with Adrian as my primary mentor. Um, at QUT, and I had four studies designed as a part of my PhD. Um, I believe it was my second study was a systematic review that actually had the question, you know, what incentives have been tested that motivate researchers to share their data? So we carried out that systematic review and we only found one study that actually had tested a incentive, you know, to motiv which motivates re researchers to share their data. And that was the Kidwell et al study that was published in 2016. And um, it was an observational study that, we, you know, as we already know. So that kind of got us thinking because I did want to do a randomized control trial. And originally we wanted to test funding as an incentive for researchers to share their data, but we didn't have funding that we could give away. So we thought, all right, well, here we have an observational study that, you know, really showed that it increased data sharing at this journal from 1.5% to about 39% over a number of years. So we thought, well, Adrian had just, um, he was on the ed, uh, editorial advisory uh, board for BMJ Open. So we contacted Adrian Altcroft at, the B at BMJ Open and asked, well, what if we actually collaborated? And we, what if we designed the study together? And I did see Brian Nosek on my way to London um, to meet Adrian Altcroft at the, um, I believe it was the World Integrity Conference, World, World Research Integrity Conference in Amsterdam. And I remember talking to you about it, Brian, and you were super encouraging. Um, so we went ahead with it. It took some time because, you know, as you know, trials take a while. 
and we had some problems with our ethics committee kind of getting involved with, you know, saying that we, you know, we had to get consent for both the control arm and the intervention arm so that people actually knew that they were part of the study. So, you know, they had to put this button on Scholar One where they would consent to be a part of our study. So in any case, you know, our study has limitations, but I think it's the only, it's the only trial that has actually tested badges as incentives for researchers to share their data. So because our motivation was to, was to actually study badges and not just implement badges, if we didn't consider BMJ Open just implementing badges just like psychological science did. We really wanted to, to do the study. Um, I don't believe they actually move forward with implementing badges, but maybe if we have more evidence and maybe they'll come on board, um, that would be really great to see more journals coming on board with implementing badges. But I really look forward to the outcome of this discussion to see where we'll go with evidence and how that informs our decisions with regard to you know, meta science and the interventions that we, that we support. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was that, um, that's great just to get that context for um, that trial. Um, so uh, my next question is for Hilda. Uh, Hilda, as as um, you've um, uh, written and talked about, what makes the Open Science Badges Initiative, this this case we're talking about in particular, such a good illustrative example for your more recent argument for more self criticism in the meta science meta science movement? G'day, thanks for, uh, thanks for asking me. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Now, my specific criticism isn't necessarily about badges per se, it's about that particular, the claims from that particular study that, that, uh, that's already been referred to a couple of times and that graph that you showed with the, you know, the dramatic increase in, uh, uh, in, a, in a percentage. Um, and so it's a very specific criticism uh, about that and about how that's received and what that, what that means. Uh, there was a really good, really good study in 2017 of the suite of interventions that psychological science introduced uh, along with the badges. The badges was one of, of a group of things. Um, and they published that in 2017. And I'm really grateful to that paper for a lot of you know, really helpful data that, that, that gives you sort of perspective on it. Um, what actually happened at that journal was a range of things that involved things that would also be a hurdle to submitting an article to the journal. So for example, in a submission form, you got in, uh, you, you needed to confirm that you were reporting all exclusions. You had to confirm that you were reporting every analysis you did of any independent variable and all the manipulations. You had to to have sample size calculations and data stopping rules. Um, the the journal changed the statistical methods that were expected. Um, they changed the evaluative evaluative criteria for articles to make them much more stringent. And the journal editor reported that they had a really big drop in submissions. Um, they also had a really big drop in the number of um, articles that were published. So the year before they started, they had published 363 articles. Within a couple of years, as this, this sort of rolled out fully, they had less than half that amount. Um, now, all of that, all of that, info, a lot of that information you actually need to get from outside the particular article that publicised uh, what happened in terms of data sharing and attributing it to badges and saying that badges alone had this dramatic increase. And of course, if you look at uh, if you look at percentages when the numbers are as small as this, by the time you're talking about uh, only about 60 badges a year and then this really big drop in your denominator of papers, um, you, you know, you've got a real lot of questions about what happened. Is this about shifting or, you know, about authors shifting and who, who may have who may have been amongst that, that large group of people that the editor said were no longer submitting uh, and so on. So, um, I, there was a real lot of questions about that, but none of that was included in the paper. The paper itself, for example, used the word dramatic or dramatically uh, nine times in one paper. I mean, that's a lot of hype um, in a paper. It made a lot of really quite dramatic claims. Um, and this got reflected in the way the movement actually responded to it. I kept seeing that graph show up, and I still do. You know, I sit there, I'm not from the, the psychology field, but I see this graph coming up all the time by people who I think should know not, not to do that. Um, and the Centre for Open Science still uses uh, that graph. Now, by the point that we're at now, um, this is also becoming cherry picking because of other kinds of studies that look at you know how how much uh, you know how much 
how much labour is it? What, what kind of incentive do, would people need who are not already uh, ready and able to, uh, to have their data in, in the form that you could uh, make it open um, to actually do that. And for them, it, it's, a, it's a quite a lot of work. So from field to field and from research to research, the amount of incentive that you might need um, to, to, to show it. I mean, if you're already somebody who can report all your uh, independent analyses, all your independent variables and every single analysis you did and everything else, then uh, sharing your data is, is, you know, you're not obviously, you know, going to be really quite... Uh, or you're quite likely to be in an easier position to actually share the data. So I think that this particular example was a really, is a really good one for me. Firstly, because it's such a textbook example of what we in, in the, the meta-science area, in clinical practice anyway, in, in the whole medical area and so on, called research spend. You know, um, there was just so much hype within the article and then around it, um, including the fact that the absolute numbers were never... Uh, given just graphs of percentages, all of those kinds of stuff. It's like a, an actual textbook example of how to exaggerate research results. Um, and watching uh, how effective that was in a group of people who were supposed to be you know, quite critical of science and the standards that they would expect was really quite uh, a frustrating thing uh, to watch just how uncritically that was embraced and how easy it was to do that. Um, there was a very slight, um, to, to the centre's um, credit, there was a very slight modification in a language that they used on their website uh, alongside that graph um, to modify how causal it looks, but it's still got that sort of dramatic thing. And now, as, the, as these couple of years have gone past, we're adding now a kind of like a cherry picking issue um, of constantly going back to this one study and not looking at the other research that people are doing around what kind of incentives you need. Um, I think it's a good example too of the risks of movements and, uh, and the self-interest that people have when they evaluate their own cherished interventions that they believe in really strongly or that might actually be really quite important to them for their funding or for their grants or whatever. Um, I'm not now speaking about this specifically, but I'm just talking in general terms. Um, activist movements just face a real lot of, a real lot of risks um, uh, in the way uh, they go forward. And I thought this was a really good example of this. I mean, the way that I get piled on by different people at any point when I ever criticise this and sort of get accused of giving aid and succour to the opponents of open science and whatever, uh, just for discussing it, um, a very, is a very good example of exactly what the risk is here. Um, why does it matter? I think it's the same as for, 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 for psychology practice or clinical practice or anything else. You've got uh, opportunity costs if people, um, you know, uh, in, invest in the wrong kind of activities or, or the, uh, the less effective uh, activities if they believe something's effective that isn't or they overestimate how effective it is. Um, and then it becomes that thing too, overall, there's kind of like a movement issue. What's the, what's the impact of telling everybody that you actually need very little effort to change, um, to change behaviour. And that was, that was how that intervention was built. It was a dramatic effect from a simple low cost intervention, um, which of course then you watched a whole lot of people saying, well, then that's all we have to do. We only have to introduce badges. And as Brian was emphasising early on, um, it was always part of something bigger. Um, so those are the reasons that I think it's a, a really good example. It, classic example of spin uh, and that it was received so uncritically and even after all this time and all of this debate uh, it's still used in that way and that graph is still used in that in that way. Wonderful thanks very much Hilda um, uh, for, for that that's that's good. I'd like to um, I've got a couple of questions for discussion um, um, but um, Brian immediately is there anything you'd like to just um, add, um, to add to that or, or um, follow on from what um, Hilda's um, said there? Um, but otherwise, I'll go just with a couple of um, things which go to the more general thing about how we evaluate uh, things um, in, in this area. Um, and, and of course, I'm, I'm happy to, to dig into those questions. I'll just sure, add as a sure. brief comment uh, that I am very grateful for the work that Anissa and Hilda is doing. I think that part of the culture that we want to cultivate is that this kind of critique can and does and should happen on an ongoing basis, whoever is the recipient of that critique. It's not that we all have to have the same priors 
or even agree after the debate happens. But the fact that the debate can happen and is part of the ordinary practice is a really good part, I think, of any healthy uh, critical community uh, like this. So just to, yeah. just to put that uh, out. Oh, fantastic. Um, something I just, uh, and I'd, I'd like to, to start with, and um, I've, thought about, I've thought about phrasing this question a couple of different ways, but um, this is just, uh, uh, and this is just about the role of randomized control trials in particular, uh, because that's played a role in, in, this, in this example we're talking about now. Um, and RCT has been um, so, sort of uh, quite um, uh, central to the advancement of, of this discussion. Um, it, it's also just, it's just a timely thing. There's been in, Amer in American Psychologists uh, just last week, there's a, an article uh, which is uh, called, uh, Now is the Time for um, Randomized Control Trials in Open Science. Um, and so it, uh, it really feels like, uh, you know, the, there is a movement towards using you know the gold standard um, for research randomized control trials in open science in meta science and so forth so given that that's sort of that's what i've um that's been shaping my thinking recently about this and so if uh well first of all um if we want to talk about a, a an accountable meta science uh movement or so forth uh are rcts um part of um the way forward um for that um and if that is the way and you know that uh, and i mean obviously observational um studies as well will, will play a role but if rcts play um a, a role as well what do we do when um results don't support um evidence for a particular an initiative um or intervention um and how much weight should we give um, rct results relative to other sources um of evidence so this is going towards the um, what do we do when, you know, if things all go our way, that's great. But when they don't, what do we do? Like, um, you know, how, how, is a, how is a movement? Um, how is individuals? Do we deal with that uh, conflicting evidence? And that's for um, every, um, everyone to um, respond to. I'm happy to go, but I just went. So if anybody else wants to go first, that's uh, that's totally fine. Yeah, um, uh, Anissa um, or, or Hilda, please. Sure. Um, you know, I think we definitely need more RCTs in this field. If we're claiming that our field is to promote more evidence-based science and more evidence-based medicine, you know, we're here, we're trying to fix the problems where we have bias, where we have outcome switching, where we're not sharing our data then we ourselves need to be evidence-based in the policies and the interventions that we promote. So, you know, I'm all for, you know, more randomized control trials in this field. And if we find that, you know, after, I don't know how many randomized control trials we need to do on badges to be able to, you know, decide that maybe it's an intervention that doesn't really work, well, we still don't have that many randomized control trials. So I don't really think that we should abandon them just yet. Um, but if we do find that, you know, hey, it's not really working, then maybe we need to consider other strategies. But I think we can do that in parallel. You know, I think we can start thinking of other incentives. Um, could funding be an incentive? Could journals, you know, reduce the cost for publishing at their journal if people shared their data? You know, could there be other strategies that could promote data sharing? Also, you know, we know that um, data sharing hasn't really been mandated either. So that's another, you know, the funders have a huge role to play and institutions have a huge role to play as well in terms of this movement and this shift. I don't think it's just going to be one intervention that's going to change the whole culture of data sharing in the field of health and medical research or in psychological science or just in science in general. So yeah, I think it's important to have more evidence and I think we need to listen to what our studies show us. We have to be open-minded and, um, you know, yeah, be open-minded to whatever whatever we, we find and move forward with that information. Um, I I I'd agree with uh, I agree with that, but I'd put uh, some context around it. I mean, I think that we have to be really 
uh, clear about the limitations of randomised trials and so on as well. So, for example, if you want to uh, go with that claim that doing something as simple as badges and nothing else, just introducing badges is going to have a dramatic impact on data sharing, uh, then you need, I believe, randomised trial to show that, or at least uh, strong studies that are looking at doing that on its own, you know, if, if that's what the claim is going to be. Um, but if you go back to Brian's uh, original sort of intro here today, uh, he was actually putting up a whole lot of other reasons uh, why you might have badges. Um, and that was like to do with the impact on a community and as part of a, a, a kind of like a, a, a movement and changing community attitudes and those sorts of things. Um, and just because randomised trials don't show that it directly introduces, you know, directly increases people submitting articles to a journal's data sharing um, doesn't disprove those other things, you know. Um, so I think that we have to kind of look at these things really, really carefully because one of the things that we know from, from clinical trials, uh, so in medicine and all those sorts of things, is that they can end up kind of being a reason to abandon an intervention too soon as well. So, uh, you know, and, and if you look at that kind of life cycle of what happens in other fields that, that, that use randomised trials a lot, um, you often then go on to, well, does it work in certain circumstances? Um, does it work in, in these? Or, you know, like, how does, how, does, how does it work differently? What, or as, you know, Anissa was pointing out, what do you have to do alongside it and, and whatever? So um, I think directly to that question of, what should we do about it? It's a, it's a question of like take it really seriously and don't cling on to uh, weaker forms of evidence as though you can uh, just shoot down the randomised trial and, and find a whole lot of reasons why it's wrong so that you can continue in your sort of confirmation bias of I still believe this intervention works no matter what anybody says and no matter what that lousy trial says or whatever. Um, don't go down that route, but also don't go down the route of throwing out the baby with the bathwater. Um, you know, you've, you've got to be asking the right questions and so on. And for some of these questions, a randomised trial um, isn't the right answer. And some of those, those questions come from a broader look at the ecosystem. So, for example, for me, uh, looking, going back to that uh, original Kidwell study um, uh, with a data thing that I wanted to see, uh, you know, I had like broader questions like, did the amount of data sharing actually increase? Um, that's a different question to uh, did a percentage, uh, did a growing percentage of a dropping number of articles, you know, a reducing number of articles uh, get a batch? Um, because that could have just, that could just, it could just mean uh, the bunch of people who were, who were, you know, able and willing to share badges, to share their data, just move from one journal to another. Um, and certainly the data that we've got about what was happening in other journals in that same time um, suggests that's a very real possibility, that it was a magnet, a bit, uh, you know, in, in Brian's original picture of saying, you know, you've got your innovators and your early adopters. Did, did they all kind of beat a fast trail over to psychological science? I mean, the data fits that, for example. And that may not be what happened, but it fits that. So you would need to kind of look at that broader thing of uh, is the overall amount of uh, data sharing increasing in the field? And that's not a question you can answer at a single journal. Um, and if so, what are the contributors to that? And that's going to involve a range of research. Like that's where like anthropologists and all sorts of uh, kind of methods of evaluation would have a really big role to play of working out are these shifts happening? And if they are, why? Um, but then, you know, at a certain point, you have actual testable hypotheses and uh, certainly uh, saying doing, you know, slapping a badge on alone has this specific effect is one of those things that I believe you need a trial for. Thank you. Um, Brian, please. Yeah, I, th I think all uh, very good points from Anise and Hilda. Uh, so I don't, I didn't hear anything on terms of particular areas of agree disagreement on uh, the role of uh, randomized trials or the the potential uh, for helping to sort out uh, different elements of what we're trying to accomplish with these. Uh, just to build on that a little bit. Um, for example, I started with the big picture on theory of change. There's no way we will do a randomized trial on that entire suite of activities as an activity, right? We're going to try to change this culture and not that culture and, you know, randomize at the level of culture. It's, it's just never going to happen. 
Uh, so there are areas where randomized trial is not possible, but I think isolating those where there is a particular claim of a particular role does have uh, a strong place. And I think that that is true of badges. Um, and so that I think is, is, a, is one where it it's, would be very beneficial to have more trials uh, extending in different methodologies and approaches. Likewise, registered reports, another one of the initiatives that we promote, uh, we would very much like uh, to have a randomized trial. We have an observational study we published recently on that, uh, but uh, we would love to get the randomized trial uh, that's under review funded. Actually, I can provide a link to that in case anybody wants to read it. Um, but that's uh, under review again at NSF. It didn't get funded the first time it was close. Uh, but um, the, so then what do we do with the evidence? So the second part of your question is like, okay, we start to get competing uh, evidence about uh, whether the things that we're pursuing are effective or not. What do we do with it? Um, and I think, I don't, I don't think I am the only one. I think everyone uh, that has involved in a lot of these initiatives well, I, I shouldn't say everyone, I'll, I'll speak for myself only, uh, that I don't care about badges or registered reports or pre-registration as those units. What I care about is the mission that we're trying to pursue, increase openness, integrity, and reproducibility of research. And if it turns out that some of these are ineffective, right? If our registered reports study showed that, oh boy, not only uh, does it make people less creative, but it doesn't actually meet the promise of what we had uh, you know, trying to make a theoretical argument for why it's going to have that case, then there's no reason to retain it, right? So we should not, and I think Hilda was making this point very strongly, we should not be parochial about the, the interventions we pursue shouldn't be the units of what we care about. The units of what we care about is the integrity of the research that we're trying to produce. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that's why, you know, we had Anissa come speak to the team uh, about the results of her randomized trial. Uh, and that's despite the fact that I don't take the trial evidence as competing with how I think of badges working. Uh, so, and, and we've talked about this, her and I be before, uh, is really, I think the visibility component is the key component. It's not as much an incentive intervention as it is a normative intervention, right? It affects the community of observers more than the person being asked uh, if they want the badge. But, that doesn't mean that the trial isn't useful. The trial uh, was a useful test of a un uh, implementation uh, that was incentives focused. Uh, and I think what the other point that Hilda made is something to build on there, which is depends on what the outcome is you're talking about. Interventions can have lots of different kinds of effects. And if the intervention is purely incentive based, I would have, I, I think, uh, an, even though it's a small trial in one, I would predict the next trial that does it the same way would also show little effect, right? Because as an incentive, all it is is a gold star. It's not connected to me getting a job. It's not connected to me getting advanced in my career. Uh, it's a gold star. And so the incentive amount uh, for any individual researcher is small uh, unless it gets connected to, well, how many badges you have does determine what job you get. Well, then I would anticipate that a trial would show uh, that the badges have an impact uh, because of it now is an actual incentive. You need those things in order to advance uh, in your career. So I, all of this stuff that we're, we're doing and trying and doing in real time is complicated, both in how the implementations are introduced, in what kinds of outcomes they can have. And so the, the meta science community is an essential part of the reform community because Reformers are going to be doing all kinds of stuff, and who knows what impacts they'll have. Meta scientists are going to help sort it out. And sometimes they're the same people, but sometimes they're not. And that's that's great. I'll stop. Thank you, Brian. That's that's great. Um, a couple of uh, questions or uh, comments in in the chat, um, which I'll just um, add into um, uh, into the, the conversation. So Adrian Barnett um, says um, a common reason trials in medicine can be discounted is inclusion and exclusion criteria that seriously harm their generalizability. Uh, these are often done for safety reasons, e.g. Um, excluding um, pregnant women. Uh, this shouldn't be such an issue in meta-research, so we should be able to run trials that closely match real practice. Um, so that, that's a um, 
that, that's that, 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 that's it. that's it. I'm just wondering, is, is there anything that um, might be um, analogous to um, harm in, in the meta-science context, or as um, Adrian says, it's um, uh, not really um, applicable in the same in the same way? I think there's harm, you know, there's the potential for harm in everything, in, in everything that can have an actual effect. You, you can have unintended effects as well as uh, intended ones. And, and, uh, and I think certainly in this area, uh, you know, issues that, that have, you, you don't want um, people who are really, really uh, have a, a, an enormous potential to make really important contributions to an area of science um, have their careers hindered or something because they you know wasted a whole lot of time doing something that that they never needed to do um, uh, and thereby got penalized you know in comparison to their more fleet of foot uh, peers who you know ignored um, whatever time waster somebody uh, had added to a process. I mean, we have a, a ton of that in, for example, in systematic reviewing, um, uh, you know, an area of meta science and looking at, uh, uh, at, at groups of clinical trials where, you know, a whole lot of requirements get added and added and added to the process um, uh, that make it harder and harder and harder to do it and take longer and longer and longer to do it. And, and if they don't actually have any payoff, then you're actually really just hampering absolutely everybody, you know. So uh, I think the potential for, for harm uh, is, is great. And as a movement, the, the, there's the potential for harm as well in that, um, you know, for, like for me as an activist, I'd be really worried about that, that thing of, of saying something like, are we sending out a message that you don't actually need to put much effort in at a journal? You know, all you have to do is slap badges on, which is the impression that you get from looking at that paper and, and, and what's on the Centre for Open Science website still now um so you know i, I think those things are, are really quite critical um and one of the things that we need to do uh, certainly learning from uh, uh, clinical medicine too is that that whole issue of uh, peri cherry picking results and in individual studies you know it becomes really quite important and one of the things that we never did never got right um, in uh, in clinical medicine is making this research really easy to find um, so that you don't, you know, inadvertently only, you know, have a couple of examples. You know, that thing about like finding research about methods is really hard because you, you do a search and you basically get every single study that used the method, you know. Um, so that whole process of, of trying to see like, as we get an increasing number of studies of different types, um, do you actually do it and uh, catalog them in such a way uh, that it's easy uh, to, to not cherry pick, if, if, you, if you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, um, um, Brian, um... Do you, um, just just on that on that last point of Hilda's about um, the that that uh, you know uh, tendency or potential to cherry pick in, in, in that way um, is that a is that a problem um, for meta science or you know is that you know uh, is that something we should be focusing on as a matter of concern in particular? Uh, only in as far as meta scientists are human uh, is it a concern, uh, and I think most are, uh, that yeah, we're going to have all the same tendencies that any other uh, area of research or any other area of reasoning more generally that humans apply uh, is going to have that uh, potential. So the, um, I know I, I said, I think in, in that Twitter thread you referenced it earlier, the, you know, the, to me, a lot of the ways in which we hold ourselves accountable, uh, and this comes from, you know, my substantive work history, implicit bias, is depending less on our good intentions. We should still try to have good intentions and do the best work we can, but to set up systems and processes that hold us accountable, external uh, to our own intentions. So that, for me, is one of the key roles of pre-registration, and what I see as a mechanism for holding myself accountable uh, in the work that we're doing. Uh, and that doesn't even need to be pre-registration just for the work that we do. Here's our design, here's our analysis, here's our plan, but also in the work that you do. So how great would it be to put me on the line and say, here's the, here's the next trial we're gonna do on badges, predict the outcome. 
and I have to, in advance, make some commitment based on the design as it's laid out to what I think is going to be the outcome. Right? You get people's priors laid out very clearly. Uh, you get you know, both skeptics and proponents of whatever is the phenomenon to agree on a design as an effective test uh, of that potential outcome. Uh, and then we have to squirm a little bit when the outcomes come out unfavorably to what I, and I have to say, oh my gosh, no, I didn't really realize that your design was like this and this and that. And now that, I, now that I see the data, I realize that the reason you didn't get my finding was because of this. And then the observer can say, oh, yeah, that looks a little bit like rationalizing. You know, so that uh, is useful at a community level, even if I am obstinate and won't revise my uh, point of view. Right, because a lot of these, when there is some, when there is someone that has skin in the game, like let's presume that I do have an investment uh, in badges, uh, that changing my mind may not be the consequential thing. Right, it's it's a getting the community uh, who doesn't have skin in it to say, wait a second, this is not useful, uh, and and here here is the why. And now that we've looked at the cumulative body of evidence. Just as a quick add-on to the points that others were making on, on your initial point of what do we need to be concerned about from Adrian's uh, comments, uh, I, th the, I think the additional concern that meta-researchers have to be particularly attentive to are Hawthorne effects and ecological validity in randomized trials. Right? The, if we're, as we're studying researchers, researchers can be particularly sensitive to what is being studied about them, uh, given what they know. And Hawthorne effects obviously are of concern in any uh, kind of uh, research, but, uh, but I think that has some particular uh, challenges for how it is we intervene uh, and evaluate our interventions as opposed to naturalistic observation and seeing what we can infer from that. That's not to privilege naturalistic observation. It's just to recognize that those constraints occur. Uh, and then with ecological validity, uh, are when we intervene on the system, are we changing it so much that it isn't the behavior that will occur naturally uh, when that is rolled out uh, versus um, uh, how we could try to do it in another way that is less obtrusive as we might need to do in intervention. So those are, are elements that, that I spend time worrying about and thinking about how we evaluate the various interventions we're promoting. Cool, thank you. Um, I'll just, uh, there's another uh, comment in the chat from Joe McKenzie. I wonder if it would be helpful to examine evidence in other areas where changes to practice are sought. For example, interventions to improve clinical practice, uh, education, audit and feedback, opinion leaders. This could give us clues to what might work for changing researchers' practice. So I guess this could be, you know, do we need to reinvent the wheel for meta science uh, when there are other exemplars and things we can be um, looking at, like for, for example, it would seem that medicine or clinical practice might be a good example. If anyone would like to speak to that. Yeah, I can share, you know, actually Adrian and I were thinking of doing a study uh, with, a, with a couple of other researchers. I think some of them might be here um, to see if, you know, for instance, a help, like a help from a data management professional, you know, could that be something that could then incentivize people to then share their data? Um, unfortunately, we didn't get funded so I think that's also another problem, you know, that is there enough funding in this field for researchers to be able to actually do research on research. Um, but I really like this idea of education as well, you know, starting from university level, you know, could there be some educational um, sessions that are offered to researchers and then following whether that impacted their data sharing practices. Um, the audit one is also interesting and yeah, I would be curious to see if, you know, others would be interested in doing research on these different components. Yeah, those are, are good points. Uh, and then just extending on that, the, um, the potential for importing things from other fields, I think, should not be underestimated. The, the science as a social system is very much like other types of social systems. And in fact, badges is drawn from existing evidence that already is like well accepted. Like, oh yeah, we know how signaling behaviors 
can help to shift norms uh, in those behaviors. The example I was giving about the gap between perceived norms and actual norms, right? There's a huge amount of health behavior literature on uh, teen drinking and uh, use of uh, drugs and all kinds of things where you're trying to figure out how do we get uh, address this gap where most teens uh, don't want to drink but feel like all of their peers are drinking and think drinking is great. Uh, boy, they've got a big information gap. And if you can give them the information of what others are doing, that changes, right? So that, this is one example of what is to me a very rich literature where this was just a very a trivial translation uh, in that case. On the other hand, registered reports does not have, as far as I know, a good backing from importing from other fields and an evidence base to support that. So from our point of view, we have a much bigger prioritization in terms of how we're investing our own efforts on trying to pursue RCTs for registered reports because of a lack of evidence base that we can lean on from existing literature compared with badges that to us are rooted in a, a longstanding literature and this is just a new application. Excellent. I'm just conscious of the time. Oh, sorry, Hilda, go I'd, I'd add uh, another aspect here because, I mean, the reason that I started to look into this and write about this was my frustration at sitting in conference halls watching the way that particular graph was used and how how people responded to it and so uncritically um, that it really struck me how susceptible this uh, community is to spin. And uh, uh, I mean, the minute I saw it, I'm going, what, that's a percentages and so on. And I'm, I'm looking at it and I'm going, it's, it's setting up all my uh, alarm bells in terms of the way the results were presented, you know. Uh, and uh, and I, I saw it done several times and by more than one person before I realised, wait a minute, we've got it. There's a real issue here around the skills of people as consumers of research data. Um, that was really quite striking uh, me. I mean, if that had been a, a drug company rep uh, doing that about a drug, uh, you know, that would have been like, you know, huge cues at the microphones of people going, and what are the absolute numbers and what the hell are you doing, you know? Um, and yet that didn't happen in this community. And that's a, that, that to me suggests that there's a lot that needs to be imported from uh, the other field about what makes people so susceptible to manipulation. Uh, and, and how do you both reduce the, uh, not just their temptation to spin their own research results in different ways, because you can pre-register and do all the rest, you can still spin results like mad. Um, uh, you know, I mean, you'll, and you'll still get away with it. People aren't going to do the work. We know that from, from protocols of clinical trials. People aren't going back to see was their outcome switching or whatever. They don't have the time. They barely read the abstract, you know. So spin works, um, no matter what you've done. Um, so that means that you've got to actually do something about uh, trying to make spin less effective uh, as, as, a, as, as a technique. Um, and we don't do enough research on debiasing. I mean, there's a ton of research on confirmation bias and all those kinds of things, but very little on how to reduce its impact. I mean, there's a little bit in medicine for how do you deal with, you know, when the, the race of the patient and the doctor are, are discordant and so on. There are, there's a little bit, but there's really not very much. Um, and whenever we just keep seeing example after example of researchers and, and all of us as consumers of research uh, um, falling for obvious, really obvious bias, then that becomes questions not just of research quality, although there's that there as well, but there's also that thing of it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be this easy to fool people with a graph that goes chunk and shows the most dramatic possible result. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Hilda. Um, because we're getting to the end of our hour already, my goodness. Um, I would love to get um, questions from the audience. Please raise your hand, like Samin has, please. Um, Samin, are you able to unmute yourself or Jason, can you? Yes, great, thank you so much. You. So this is fascinating to me because I'm one of the people who's used this graph uncritically in talks. And, um, and so it's interesting for me to reflect about why I put the graph up and, and was so uncritical about it. Um, and what that might, what broader lesson we might take from that. And so thinking about it for me, I think there were a couple of, of factors that fed into that. One is that I think the descriptive data are 
are, are striking, but I take your point that when you put in the raw absolute numbers, they may be less so. Um, and so there's some of it was, ex right, I was excusing it because of, I'm not necessarily accepting the, all the interpretations in the paper, but I'm sharing the effect itself. But I think the bigger one is that I was bringing a lot of priors to my interpretation of these data. And a lot of those are really field specific and even maybe specific to knowledge of, or beliefs about that specific journal, that specific time, other things like that. And so, and that was, I think, reducing how much I was engaging my critical thinking skills. So this is something to think about in terms of what else, where else that might be happening, who might be most susceptible to this, and in what case are priors a valid source of information, and, what, and to what degree are priors um, a source of blinding us to obvious methodological flaws that we would see otherwise. Um, yeah, I think that those are maybe some broader lessons to take away from this. Sorry, that's not exactly a question. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Samin. Uh, any other any other questions or comments at this at this stage? Well, I'll just uh, do a quick yeah. response on on Samin's because uh, a lot of that resonates uh, for me, especially that uh, the comments about the context of the time. Uh, I'll I'll say uh, that I think they the magnitude of the effect observed there is the largest that would ever possibly be observed of any of these uh, interventions. And I think it was because of a perfect confluence of the context uh, in that particular situation, uh, which was a field that was talking about these issues a lot. Uh, the premier journal uh, in that field that sort of demonstrate this is, uh, you know, what everybody wants to be in that journal. Uh, and what I would consider to be essentially a perfect implementation uh, of how to do signaling uh, in a way that is informed by uh, the, the behavioral uh, research literature uh, on influence. Uh, so there's, I, I, if I were a betting person, I would bet that that will be the outlier of every study that gets done uh, on badges, unless we can find a similar context uh, that is quite as perfect. Uh, but just to try to resonate with uh, the points that Samin was ra raising there. So. But see, the problem here is you're still talking about it as an effect of badges alone, and that simply wasn't. I mean, it was part of a set of things that were done at the same time. Um, and yeah, that's where we have whether, just differences you know, that's of just interpretation. Impossible. That's just impossible to unpick. I would agree that there was an impact of that suite of interventions. Um, whether there was an impact of badges alone is the issue. Yeah, I, I totally hear your perspective on it, and I just I disagree based on plausibility. And we can obviously unpack that, but we've talked about that before. Uh, but yeah, I, a perfectly reasonable position to take. Okay, we have about like a minute a minute to go, um, or, or so. It, uh, are there any other final questions or comments from um, anyone? I'll give it a little bit a little bit longer. And oh yes, and we've got the oh yes, we have the um, hackathon um, in the next in the next session. Um, so we just got to make sure we um, vacate in time. So what I'll what I'll do is I will say um, Brian and Isa Hilda, thank you all so much for this panel. I've enjoyed it really really so much, and I'm so glad you could all fit in the time to um, be part of it. Thank you. <laughs>